rise and join me in the call to worship. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving.
money for the two cents meal offering. So if you have that, please come up and put it in the little church right there.
until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. This song, well, it's not a song actually today. It is the song of Zechariah, which you can find in Luke chapter 1. But nevertheless, we're going to do it the same way as we always do. And this section will uh, read the unfolded section. And this section, led by Lisa, will read the, or will read the bolded section. And we will read it together that way. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up the mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from the Lord, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who Do you have your tree up yet or your nativity scene? 
we're prepping for the open house of plants, so we've got more than you can imagine. More garlands and <laughs> candles and lights and you can shake a stick at. And the church is beautiful. We've got this gorgeous tree and Marcetta's and children are doing such a good job teaching us about the journey to Bethlehem. Our whole world gets transformed in December. It's all kind of soft and warm and beautiful and it smells like peace. So Coming to church this morning and hearing this scripture lesson might come as a bit of a shock. It's not warm and fuzzy. It certainly doesn't smell like cookies. Here comes John the Baptist, dressed in rough clothes with, frankly, even rougher manners. You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the tree. Now, I'm still a baby pastor, but I'm pretty sure that this is not how you treat your congregation if you want to continue to have a congregation. <laughs> but it doesn't get better after that. Then, he starts talking about Jesus. Baby Jesus, meek and mild. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Faced with verses like this, is it any wonder that our response is often to try to get out from under them? They're too heavy. It's tempting to just deny them. I recently, about a year ago, heard someone say uh, that the God described in these and similar verses of the Bible are simply not the God he knows and worships. Another popular approach is to suggest that the Bible is just a record of ancient human beings' understanding about God, and we know better now. One of my favorite theologians responds to these weasel attempts by saying that if you try this kind of thing, then you've given up the privilege of interpreting scripture ever again, especially when it turns around and says something convenient for you. We who confess the Christian faith also confess that Scripture is not just a record of the religious <laughs> understanding of ancient people, although it is that, but that by grace and the Spirit, it is also God's Word for us today. So if we're going to be faithful, we don't get the option of ducking away from an unpleasant verse or passage. We've got to face it head on. What John does in this passage is systematically take away any hope that his listeners might have had that things are really not so bad after all. He's out in the wilderness, living off the land. He's in the middle of nowhere, and he looks like it. But he doesn't manage to put people off. They're coming out in droves to hear them preach and teach and be baptized by him. The baptism he's offering seems to be kind of a visible sign of repentance. And most of the people he's baptizing seem to be ordinary people. You know the kind. They love God, but they're not operating under any delusions of their own perfection or their own piety. Plain, salt of the earth kind of people. But one day, John looks up and sees a bunch of Pharisees and Pharisees coming at him. Sometimes when we read the Bible, we get the idea that the Pharisees and the Sadducees are the villains. They're the ones who use religion for their own ends. And it's true that Jesus does accuse them of things like that. But there's also a good argument to be made that Jesus was a Pharisee. And the reason Jesus is so hard on them is because they're not living up to their own standards. You're always harder on the people, you know, you fight worse with your own family than you do with strangers. <coughs> the truth is that if you or I not a Pharisee or a Sadducee in the first century, we'd be struck with their love for God and their desire uh, for holiness and obedience to his law. Actually, we might 
find that they're more like us or more like who we aspire to be than we're really comfortable with, considering what all the Bible has to say about them. The problem is, of course, that they were human, and so they also were probably uh, more struck than they should have been by their love for God and their desire for holiness and obedience. So they go out in the wilderness to meet John and to be baptized for repentance. Maybe because it's a good thing to do, because it's what all the religious people were doing. Maybe if we're being cynical, because it's nice to hear people say, oh, surely you don't have anything. So imagine how shocked they must have felt when they're met not with praise for their own piety, but with, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from their wrath to come. It's like a one-two punch. There was the right book, deflating any puffed up ideas they might have had about their own righteousness. And before they can really recover, here comes the left one just in case they wanted to claim the purity of their ancestry as a reason for their own spiritual excellence. John ridicules the whole idea. Don't act like being a child of Abraham to something rare and special that God can't do without. God can make children of Abraham out of these stones. And then, once they're off balance, he comes in with an agricultural metaphor to drive his point home. Now, I'm not a farmer, but I suspect that a farmer doesn't particularly care what a fruit tree thinks about itself, or how good its parent tree was. You call them parent trees? I'm not sure. The tree it came from, how good it was at producing fruit. What matters is the tree itself. Is it any good? So bear fruit in keeping with repentance, he says. The axe is already laid at the root. The situation is urgent. But if we read this text and just come away with the idea that John is being mean, or that the situation is past hope, or that we read this and are just stressed out by it, I think we haven't read it's not all bad. John's diatribe, as fierce as it is, as harsh as it is in some ways, is framed by the invitation to repent. He doesn't come after them and call them vipers and devalue their heritage because he hates them or because God hates them. The bitterness of his words is like the bitterness of medicine. He's not trying to hurt them. He's trying to help them. He presents to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Jebeth and the Sadducees, the situation as it is, in all its gravity. But in the call to repent, he also offers them the great good news of God. And I think in this situation, that good news is twofold. First, and maybe most surprisingly, in the very explicit threats of judgment that we want to wiggle our way out of if we can, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? The axe is laid at the root of the trees. He will gather his wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will, he will burn with unquenchable fire. Those unpleasant sayings, the expressions of judgment, we find in those a God who is implacably opposed to evil, opposed to what harms us, opposed to what causes our suffering, opposed to what in the end kills us. He's opposed to the pain that we inflict on others and perceive ourselves. And because <coughs> That opposition is God's opposition. The evil that he has made his enemy is certainly going to be destroyed. That's the first bit of good news. That God is not going to let evil win. And here's the second. In the call to repentance, we discover that even though none of us are completely free from evil, 
God has not made us his enemy. His desire and will is that all evil should be destroyed, but it is not his will or desire that we should be destroyed along with it. The God who created the world and everything in it by the word of his power knew you know, and he did it not because he didn't create it because he needed it. He created it because he wanted to. And he knew before he created it that people were going to fall. He knew before he created the world that there was going to be evil in it. And he made it anyway. And long before creation, he decided what he would do to save us. That's the context in which John's invitation and command is issued. Repent, turn away from the evil that is hurting the world, that's hurting you, that's killing you, and instead live in the light of God's love. When I was growing up, I had the unfortunate idea that Sundays in Advent were uh, an opportunity for us to pretend that Jesus had not come yet, and that Christmas was about pretending that Jesus had just been born. And, you know, there was a reason for that. The church gets flooded with that kind of message around now. Uh, we sing hymns, and we've got liturgy sometimes that say we're waiting for the Christ child. I've actually even seen things that claim a kind of cyclical nature to all this. The miracle of Jesus' birth repeats every December. Here we are, waiting for baby Jesus. But when you see things like that, isn't there a little voice in the back of your head that likes to point out, this is all very nice, but Mary and Joseph are long dead, and uh, Jesus has already been born. Am I the only one? And you know what? Uh, for once, the cynical voice is right. Once was enough. It worked the first time. Jesus doesn't have to be born every December. It took what we do do during Advent and during Christmas is to remember with joy and gratitude that God did not abandon us to the destructive power of our own sin. That when God declared war on evil, he did not also declare war on us. That the call to repent is not issued in anger or futility. Instead, in love, what we could not do for ourselves, extricate ourselves from the sticky web of sin and hurt and evil, he came among us as a tiny baby to do. And remembering with gratitude is not the only thing we do during Advent. We also look forward with gratitude and hope, because surely, the one who came to us in love to save us will not stop until his war against evil is completely won and all things in heaven and on earth are made new. But we'll talk about that some more next week. So to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly than anything we could ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Hymn is number eight. <coughs>
Christ. Through the sacrament of baptism, we share in the death and resurrection of Christ and are incorporated into Christ's holy church. Baptism proclaims the faith of the church, and by the sign of water, we confess that God cleanses from sin and renews light and prefigures the reconciliation of all things promised in Christ. In baptism, we are given the Holy Spirit as a pledge of this reconciliation. The same Spirit binds us to each other and joins us to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Could you please present the candidate for holy baptism? I'll present bonded buildings for the sacrament of baptism. Bonnie, putting your whole trust in the grace and love of Jesus Christ, do you desire to be baptized? Yeah. Will you continue to walk with Ronnie in this new life in Christ? Will you with God's help? I will. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of water. Over water, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. With water, you destroyed evil in the days of Noah. Through water, you led the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt into the land of promise. In water, your son Jesus received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Christ, that he may lead us through his death and resurrection from the bondage of sin into everlasting life. We thank you, loving God, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. By it, we share in resurrection. Through it, we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we receive into the community of faith those whom you have called and justified. Pour out your Holy Spirit, that is, Ronnie is made a new creation through these baptismal waters. He may preach good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, and set at liberty those who are oppressed. To Christ, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. I ask you to reject sin, profess your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and confess the faith of the Church. Do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against them? And say, if so, say, I renounce them. Do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? I renounce them. Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? If so, I renounce them. Do you renounce evil and its power in the world which defy God's righteousness and love? I renounce them. Do you renounce the ways of sin that separate you from the love of God? Let us join with those who are to be baptized in professing the faith of the church. Please rise. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit.
Please be seated.
All things in heaven and on earth are yours, O Lord, and of your own we have given you. Follow these gifts with your blessing, so that wherever they go, they may spread your good news and bring the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. Hymn is number 228. 